the right one? Nope. 375. Sorry about that, guys. Um, 375. There we go. Let's stand and sing this song as well in times like these. Let's all stand together one last time in times like these. about the, uh, the importance and the, the great message that we can actually know Jesus. Uh, that it's just not a matter of uh, reading about him, uh, but that he is a personal savior, uh, noting that he is one who uh, resides within the believer, uh, part of the Godhead, and it's something that we can uh, 
rejoice together uh, regarding our risen Savior. Uh, but as John points out this fact that it's something uh, that he has witnessed and something that he's beheld, uh, the word of life, it brings encouragement to Christians today, bringing us into a place of joy, a uh, joy that's not just uh, a smile on our face, but a joy that is full and it's abounding. But as he moves into the rest of this chapter, he moves from this understanding of uh, something that uh, uh, is our, uh, our fellowship, something that we can declare together, and moving on to the thought of what this message is that we are able to proclaim. A message that only we as Christians can honestly uh, tell others about because we know for a fact that there is scriptural evidence uh, uh, of a full understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Read with me in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings of the word of God in which we can find comfort, joy, conviction. Lord, we need this this evening. Lord, we don't want to walk here out today, Lord, not gathering exactly what we need from your word. I ask that you would hide me behind the cross, help for the words that are spoken to honor and glorify you. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would bless. Uh, we have many prayer requests that come throughout the week, but Lord, right now, just thinking of Terry, just thinking of his wife who's uh, in the uh, hospital right now, Lord, and just uh, she's uh, started her chemo, and uh, Lord, just a lot of complications have happened over the last week, and uh, Lord, I ask that you would be with Terry, be with uh, Charmaine, Lord, I ask that you would uh, comfort them, that you would heal Charmaine, Lord, and help her to know that there is a God, help her to know that uh, there are church families that love him, uh, uh, that love her and uh, that uh, care for her and really want her to recover, and uh, Lord, help for Terry to be encouraged in this. Lord, it's a troubling time, and oftentimes for a new Christian, this is the point in their life where they want to run away. But Lord, this is where they need to understand that uh, you are in complete control and that they can rest in you. And uh, Lord, help us as a church family to continue to pray for them, to encourage them, to show them uh, God's love uh, and, and every aspect of life. Uh, Lord, continue to bless uh, Open Door Baptist Church. We're so thankful for uh, the opportunities that you have set before us. And Lord, even as I, I look at my calendar over the next year and I think it's completely full, uh, there's no time to breathe. But Lord, we know that uh, we are not staying busy uh, just because we're trying to do it in our own power. But Lord, uh, we are working as if it all depends on you. But Lord, may we also pray as it all depends on you. Uh, and uh, I ask that, uh, that you would just guide every step that we take and help us to work fervently uh, and trust you through the process. Lord, bless the fundraisers that we have coming up. Lord, bless the uh, new families that we have uh, come to our church. Lord, help us to be an encouragement to them and to draw them closer to you. Uh, Lord, we ask that uh, we would take the steps that are needed uh, to be uh, the light in the community that we ought to be. And uh, Lord, help us to proclaim that God is light. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen question that we want to ask ourselves today is this understanding of sin. Uh, we can say, you know, does sin bother me? You know, is sin, uh, does sin uh, mean anything to us? Is it just a, a byproduct of our life? Um, how many have used the phrase, I'm only human? I'm only human. I mean, but if we really think about it, what was Jesus? I mean, I know he was deity, but he was also what? Humanity. So are we speaking about our humanity and this saying, you know, God didn't do a sufficient job on human, humanity? Well, Jesus took part in humanity as well. It's not the fact that we are human. It's taking responsibility for who we are, taking responsibility for our actions, taking responsibility for our very sin <laughs> and our means of falling into sin. Uh, using the excuse that, well, you know, I'm human. You know, there's a lot of other people that are human too, and they make mistakes. 
You know, is it sin or is it a mistake? You know, how do we view sin? Now, we could talk about sin, and I could keep saying sin, sin, sin over and over again until it gets to a point where somebody just starts feeling uncomfortable, like, why are we still talking about sin? <laughs> we need to move on. You know, last week, speaking about uh, from the book of Isaiah, and uh, they, somebody told me that I spoke too much on sin last week. And I just thought, wow. I was like, well, that's, that's bothersome. I guess there must be conviction involved in what's happening <laughs> in our lives. I'm telling you, I need to be reminded of it. Because if we get to a place in our life where we don't think sin is as controlling as it is, if sin is not as powerful as it is, now it's not more powerful than God, but it is powerful. And if it's not as attractive as it is, then we allow ourselves to fall. And Hebrews, he mentions over and over again, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, you know, reminding us, or 1 Corinthians 10, 12, reminding us that we ought to take heed lest ye fall. Speaking about us as Christians today. But does sin bother you? You know, when we speak about maintaining fellowship with God, as this is what first, uh, John is speaking of in this passage about how we can maintain that fellowship with him, uh, we're not talking about our efforts in having a relationship with God. You know, God has done it all. He's done everything that would come to, a, that would help us and allow us to have the greatest relationship we could ever have with God. He's done it all. But when our relationship is severed because of sin, we ought to understand that that is very much our fault. That is very much something that we've allowed to wedge between us and God. See, Romans 8 tells us that there, that there is a point in our Christian walk where we struggle with the flesh. Romans chapter 7 does the same thing. Paul reminds us that there is a struggle with sin. If we are saved, our attitude and lifestyle should reflect God. See, God is light. And who we are as Christians, that light ought to reflect off of us to the world. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. The Bible tells us that we are the salt and the light of the earth. We ought not to hide under a bushel or will diminish the influence of light we have on the world. But we also must not let the world affect us because it will cause us to lose our flavor. See, fellowship with God is a key component to the Christian life. And if we think that we can operate without closeness with God, then we are no better than those Pharisees and Sadducees who thought, I just need to know the truth. I don't need to live it. It doesn't need to be a part of my life. It just needs to make others think that I'm close to God. In this passage, read with me in verse 5, it says, this then is the message which we have heard of him. Who is him? It's Jesus Christ. We heard this message from God's lips. And he says, and we declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We ought to understand the pure nature of of God. He says this is the message. This is a, a claim of authority that, uh, that uh, John is displaying here. Uh, he's not making something up. Uh, this is not just his own personal opinions or his own ideas of God. He says this is the message from God himself that he is light. See, when John tells us that about God and what God has uh, told him about himself, there is this confidence that's coming over John as he's saying, this is the message, the message I've told you from the beginning, that we have heard it, we have seen it with our own eyes, we have looked upon it, our hands have handled it, the word of life. He says, yes, God is light, and we can be confident, not in opinions or in ideas, but we can be confident in the genuine, founded proof of God himself in scripture he says this is the message he says god is light this is john declaring that there's a, a simple understanding that we have to have of god is that god is light <laughs> just a simple understanding that god is light and in him is no darkness at all if you're familiar with the sun how many of you guys can stare at the sun successfully oh, nobody can you know that light is so bright that you know It'll burn your eyes out. But you know, when they would actually examine the sun, they would actually even find some dark spots on the sun. Isn't that interesting? 
And you say, no, there's no way. It's so bright. It's so, there's so much light there, but yet there's dark spots on the sun. When John is talking about God is light, he's, and there, in him is no darkness at all, he is brighter than the sun, which has dark spots in it. See, light is purest, the most subtle, the most useful, the most uh, uh, diffusive of all of God's creation. It's the, it's the emblem of purity, perfection, goodness. And as we see here, it's part of divine nature that God is light. See, God is perfect purity. In him is no darkness at all. You know, for there to be darkness, there must be the absence of light. It's their absence of light in our life is because we've decided to push God into the picture. God is light. No darkness at all. He says, therefore, if there's a, a, a problem with our fellowship with God, it is indeed our fault. There's no darkness at all. It's not the fault of God because there's no sin. There's no darkness in him at all. You see, any approach to a relationship with God that assumes or even implies that God might be wrong, <laughs> that, is, that is a root of blasphemy that we ought not to operate with as Christians. Too often I, I hear people, you know, fault God with certain things. Or they look at scripture and they just say, God just didn't do a very good job. Oh, well, God just has his problems. But I see in scripture that you're very much wrong. See, it's not that we go to God's word to find problems with that. We go to God's word to find problems with us. Because too often when we get away from God's word, then we forget about our own our own problems. We, we get away from the mirror that reveals to us exactly who we are. But when we get into God's word, we do feel a discontentment in our life. You know, that, 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 you know, that complacency that's come over us in our Christian walk where we think we could just operate at a certain level and we think we're okay because we could just ride the waves. But in reality, God never said, it was, or even Jesus himself never said that it was supposed to operate that way. There are problems that happen in our life, and it's because there's always ever going battle between us and sin. We can always have the victory over sin, but there will always be the battle with sin. You may say, well, I'm just overwhelmed by this. You know, this is not how I view life. Well, we ought to understand that sin is a problem. And sin has a big control over us. But see, we are bought with a price. We are saved by the blood of the Lamb. We don't have to allow sin to have dominion over us. We can say no to sin. We have the ability, the power to say no. <laughs> and we can trust in God through those things because God is light. In Him is no darkness at all. His light will shine down on us. But to say that God did something wrong or God is the problem with what is happening in our life, we clearly don't understand John's teaching here as he says, I wanted to declare to you this message that God is light, no darkness in him at all. The right person that can judge a Christian who lives in darkness is one who is in light. That's God. <laughs> he has the very right to judge us. Not only is he creator God, but he is also light and in him is no darkness at all. But notice in verse 6 that John confronts hypocritical Christians and assume that the problem is all God, not themselves. It says, if we say, notice how John throws himself into that category because he's speaking of Christians, but he's also pulling himself in. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, that is fellowship with God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if we're telling people that we walk in the light, and yet we don't, we're liars. 
We have no truth in us. See, John, he's first dealing with this, this false claim of fellowship, you know, based upon, you know, what we can understand about uh, 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 the, the claim of a relationship with God is that you have to be in the light. <laughs> you can't be in the darkness and say, I have a great relationship with God. <laughs> I'm walking in darkness, but it's okay because I have a great relationship with God. Seems quite hypocritical, is it not? It's as if walking through a dark forest, and you're like, you know, you can't see anything. You're walking in darkness, but you're just like, you know, it's okay. I have the flashlight in my pocket. I'm good to go. I can make it through the forest, and I can walk in darkness all day. But I got the light in my back pocket just in case. Just in case what? <laughs> you're walking in darkness. Grab the light, the light that can see her through darkness, the light that has no darkness at all in it, but yet we want to go through life living in darkness, thinking that we are going to come out the other end successful when God says, you walk in darkness. He's just as he explained the Pharisees, it's the blind leading the blind. They both fall into a ditch. Is it possible for someone to think they have a relationship with God when they don't have one? It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. See, many Christians are not aware of their true condition. They know they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. They know that they're destined for heaven because only Jesus Christ could be the perfect sacrifice to take away the sin of the whole world. But yet, they don't examine themselves daily. They know they're saved. They know they've experienced conversion. They have repented. But yet they don't have true fellowship with God. See, in Philippians 1.27, he reminds us that our conversation, that is to say our walk and our talk, our conversation should point others to Christ. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. What is our walk and talk like? Here, John is just examining our talk. Now, if there's one thing we know about our talk is that it overpowers our walk all the time, does it not? Well, I do this and I do that and what a successful person I am. But then we know that the walk speaks louder always than the talk. But here John is showing the hypocrisy in the Christian life in that as we say we have fellowship with him, we walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth. See, John speaks of this walk in darkness, indicating a, an, a, a pattern of living. This walk in darkness. It's not just something, oh, I slipped. Oh, man, you know, I went the wrong direction. We're talking about a consistent walk. A consistent direction in which we've found not an occasional lapse in, but just a lifestyle difference. See, the world has a way of pulling us in. And sometimes we get pulled in and we excuse it as a form of, uh, of separation. You know, it's those that have been co so consumed by darkness that they, when light is presented to them, they almost see it as foreign. Like, what is that? You know, oh, 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 what is that for? The pattern of living that we have is it a pattern that's walking in darkness because he said if we are walking in darkness he said that we lie see God has no darkness in him at all and if we are telling people that we walk in the light and yet walk in darkness what are we telling other people oh God's darkness that's why I'm able to do this Oh, no, that goes against God's word, right? Because in him is no darkness at all. So if we're walking in darkness without God, then there's the hypocrisy there. One claims to be in fellowship with God as that relationship, that common relation, the common interest, the common sharing, but yet we walk in darkness. We don't have a truthful claim. I want you to understand that the issue here is not salvation. The issue is fellowship. Over and over again, this is what John is declaring to us, that our fellowship. See, the Christian who temporarily walks in darkness is still saved, but he has no fellowship with God that he wants to have. 
that needs to have. I want you to understand that there's no gray area here. It's either black or white. So even if you have a smidget of darkness, it's, it's still darkness. Because with God, there's, there's, there's no darkness at all. The truth is God's word. And when we walk in darkness, we are going against God's word. It says if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Can we honestly stand before God and say, yes, I've been walking in the light as you are in the light. I have fellowship with you because I've been walking in the light. Or will we be those that are called out as liars? Because we have darkness in our life. I'm not talking about sin in your life. We're all sinners. We all have a tendency to fall. What I'm talking about is not the lapse. I'm talking about the lifestyle, the walk, the consistent walk that we have in our life. What direction are we going with it? Is our direction towards God or towards the world? Is our direction towards me or is it towards God? How are we walking? What is our walk like? Well, look at verse 7. This is how he describes the walk. He says, but if we walk in the light, once again describing all of us, category Christians, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanseth us from all sin. How is our walk? Is it walking in darkness? Are we liars or are we walking in the light? This means that our walk is in general obedient light without harboring known sin or resisting the conviction of the Holy Spirit in any particular point. There are those that believe, oh, until I feel really horrible about my sin, then that's the only time that I'll actually repent. But this, God's word has already told us it's sin, and the reason that you're not feeling bad about it is because you've convinced yourself it's not bad. So you're never going to feel remorse for your sin. Never. You're never going to feel remorse for how bad you are because you've neglected this and trusted this. And the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. So if we're going to walk in the light, we ought to trust God's word. It's a mirror to reveal to us who we are. And yes, we know that James speaks about those who are a doer of the word, that as a man beholding his natural face in the glass, he beholdeth himself, then goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But we can be those Christians that look in the mirror of God's word, recognize the error of our way, and correct it. And say, God, why am I not being convicted about this? Why am I not feeling bad about the sin in my life? Why has this allowed to be a part of my life? Lord, forgive me. Show me the conviction of my heart so I never go this direction again. But many do not want to pray that prayer to God because the next time it comes up, boom, conviction sets in. They'd rather, oh, I'm just going to wait till I feel like it's a really bad thing. He tells us to walk in the light. You know what? I want you guys to, uh, this is the way I read scripture, but he says, but if we walk in the light, just the fact that John says this, it means it's possible. All right. See, after I just got done explaining all those things, just the fact that John is telling us that we can walk in the light tells us it's possible. So don't lose heart. <laughs> Sin is not an easy subject to talk about especially for a sinner to stand behind the pulpit and preach it. But we must understand that walking in the light is very much possible. And from now to this side of eternity, looking forward to glorification. The Christian life is, is described as a walk. It's described as a race. It's described as an activity in our life. And the Christian life feeds upon, you know, this, this contemplation, but it displays itself in action. Understand that walking, this implies action, continuity, uh, uh, progress. You know, sin, uh, since God is active and walking, if we have fellowship with him, then we are active and walking. My wife was talking about when she was running, and she was running with uh, one of the ladies in uh, her, uh, her group, 
She says that as she was running around the park, she would pause and, you know, they would just start, you know, walking, taking steps. And she would start talking to this lady and, you know, talking about different things. And, and she's just like, yeah, you know, this great city. Sarah's just panting, you know. She's just like, man, I haven't been running in a while, you know. And she's just talking a conversation. All of a sudden, this girl just starts running faster. So Sarah's just like, you know, trying to keep up and trying to catch up to the lady. And she's just taking off and running. You know, she's doing it in, in, in spots. But Sarah's just like, our conversation stopped as soon as she took off. You know, as soon as Sarah got into a touchy subject, you know, she's just like, oh, I got to catch up to her again. And then finally they catch up. She starts slowing down. So they're able to have a conversation again. And then she takes off again. And Sarah's trying to catch up again. You think about the Christian life in this aspect. You know, we can walk alongside of God, talk to God, and we could walk. But as soon as we allow ourselves to pull away, God is still walking. God's still walking. What are we doing when it comes to following the light? Have we pulled off the trail and said, but this looks so great over here. Christian life is described in our walk. He says, but if we walk in the light. Notice that he says here as well. He says, as he is in the light. We've already described that God is light. Uh, and in him is no darkness at all. When we walk in the light, we walk as he is. We are naturally together with him in fellowship. We read about Adam and Eve in the garden. The Bible tells us that Adam walked with God in the garden. We read about the life of Enoch. It says Enoch walked with God. We too can walk with God. These that have left before us. Hebrews chapter 11 reminds us that they didn't receive the promise, but we live in this era of promise. We live with what Christ has done. We can have a closer relationship than they had. He says, we have fellowship. You know, we would have expected John to say, we have fellowship with God, but this is what he says next. He says, we have fellowship with one with another. <laughs> he says, if you're walking with God, he says that we're going to have fellowship one with another. If you make it your key goal in life to walk with God, you don't have to worry about who's going to be hanging around you. Too often, this is what we do today. I just wish I had a friend. I just wish I had somebody that thought the way I thought, did the things I wanted to do. But what God tells us to do is walk in the light as he is in the light then we will have fellowship one with another. If we want to have true fellowship and true joy in our, how, in our hearts and a joy that's full, we need to walk with God because eventually God, they're going to find somebody that's doing the exact same thing. And that's what we want. We want to have fellowship one with another. But if we do not have fellowship one with another, that means that one, at least one or both parties are not walking in the light. Two Christians who are in the right relationship with God will also naturally be in a right relationship with others. Too often we, we think that we have to, in a relationship, we're walking with God and we're staying close to God. And then we find out that someone else in our relationship doesn't want that same relationship. And we all almost feel like, oh, I need to take a step back. Man, I'm getting too much of that, that pushy Christian stuff. You know, I got to take a step back and therefore be in fellowship with them. Well, that's not what God tells us to do. He says, be in fellowship with him, and therefore, we'll have fellowship one with another. And if those are not in connection with you, then they'll either have to <laughs> catch up, <laughs> or hopefully your light you know, will be a blessing to them. It shows them exactly what they need to do. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, walking in the light, we enjoy that continual cleansing of Jesus. See, when you're in the light constantly, your sin is being revealed to you constantly. You may say, man, that's just an overwhelming feeling. But what's so great is that the closer you get to God and the short accounts you keep with God, that when something is in your life that you know it shouldn't be there and it's a sin against God's word, then you can confess that to God. And you make it a point to confess those things before God because you know that you're going to be in the presence of God. It's like when Sarah and I were dating. Like, if I knew I was going to be with Sarah, I mean, I'd work really hard all week long. You know, the hair would be messed up. Everything would just be out of order. You know, you, you, you grab your shirts, try to find that clean shirt. But when you're in the presence of someone you love, man, 
you do the laundry, you know, take a shower, you do your hair, you brush your teeth, you wear that nice cologne. Because I knew I was going to be in the presence of Sarah. See, when you're in close connection with God, this is the same attitude that will come over you. I'm getting ready to talk to God. We don't just walk up to God and say, I can't talk to God right now because I just got so much sin in my life, so I'm not going to pray to you, God. <laughs> I just got too much going on. No, we just say, I need to get this over with because I love God and I want to talk to him. We take care of those things. We need a continual cleansing because the Bible says continual sin falls short of God's glory. Even though Christ, uh, Christians have been cleansed and the most important sense of our cleansing, we know that our feet get dirty and they need cleaning because we're doing a lot of walking. <laughs> In the Christian life, you're doing a lot of walking. See, the, root, uh, the verb that John is using here, it's cleanseth us from all sin, is that it, it's set in that present tense. It's not set in a future tense. It's set in a present tense. You know, we could do more merely with hope, but we will one day be cleansed. Well, I hope I'll be cleansed one day. No, he's talking about something that can happen now. Something that happens deliberate now. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, we can be cleansed today. Why are we living in sin? Why do we continue to go down this route of sin when we can go to God right now and take care of it right now? Well, I just need to feel like I need to confess these things and feel guilty about it, but that's not what he's saying. He says, do it now. Take care of it now. The relationship is so much more important than your pride. Take care of it now. This continual cleansing is is done by the blood of Jesus Christ. Understand Christ's sacrifice and what he did for you. See, we look at it and we say, yes, he paid the penalty for us to go to heaven, but John gives us a bigger sense that this blood cleanses us from all sin. That means we can go to him constantly in our Christian life and continue to go to him, asking him for forgiveness. He shed his literal blood for us. He did so on our behalf, and he did so past, present, future, you know, when we look at the word blood, do we just think of a red color? Or do we actually think of what it actually is? Death. He died for us. It promotes, or denotes, rather, sacrifice that he shed for us. It doesn't merely deal with the guilt of sin I want you to understand that he deals with that stain of sin. The stain of sin in our life. That hinder us from a continual relationship with him. We need to come to God simply noting that he can cleanse us by the blood of Jesus Christ. He could do so from all sin. See, it's easy for us to skip over those words all, but man, I love circling them in scripture because they're such a powerful word. We can be cleansed from the blood of Jesus Christ. We know there was a sin inherited from Adam and we know that there are sins that we commit from day to day in our life, but each of those things are recognized in the concept of sin. We can go to God for cleansing in every aspect of of our life. See, sin is the hindrance to our fellowship with God. This is what 1 John chapter 1 is all talking about. How is your fellowship? If the case was that every time we sin, we need to get saved again, man, talk about the exhausting Christian life. Talk about something that's impossible. It would be impossible to go to heaven. You may say, well, I just don't understand. You know, if I, you know, if I just keep doing right, well, then you're speaking about sinless perfection, which leads to this life of antinomianism, which is understanding that it's a convictionless Christianity, that I don't do anything wrong anymore. Therefore, I'm under the blood of Jesus Christ. So anything I do is all in the blood of Jesus Christ. They miss the point of a fellowship relationship with God. They miss it because they allow themselves to say, I want both instead of I want light because in him is no darkness at all. We don't know what true joy is. 
until we embrace what John says. Your joy will be full if you understand this message. Your joy will be full if you understand the presence of God and the cleansing that he offers. Because he closes out this passage here in verse 8 where he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. He repeats this a statement that he made earlier in regard to our sin, in regard to our darkness. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But now he's saying, but if we say that we have no sin, he says, you may say, you know what, I, I may not be walking in darkness, but it's because I have sinless perfection. <laughs> what? Well, I'm pretty sure this verse right here tells us that sinless perfection is not something that exists. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. To think it is to deceive ourselves. We've convinced ourselves of a lie, and we've built our life upon this lie. There are people today, I've listened and I've read books, that promote sinless perfection. And that they themselves has reached it. I remember when I was a kid and I sat in a service and the pastor got behind the pulpit and he started preaching. And the very first thing he said is, it has been three months, six days, four hours since I sinned last. And I remember just sitting there as a kid. And I mean, I must have been like maybe 11. And I just remember going, what? Like for me, I'm just thinking, how many sins did I commit since breakfast? You know, but he's over there going, oh, I know exactly the last day that I sinned. I want you to let you know that uh, he was the worst person I had ever been around. And I was a kid. But I remember just everything he did, ever since he made that statement, he came over to our house afterwards, we were eating food and, and different things like that. Everything he said, he did, it was, it was sin. I could see it. And I was 11. And there I am going, yeah, but that's a sin. Yeah, but that's a sin. Yeah, but that's a sin. You know, I felt like my eight-year-old daughter who calls out everybody on everything that they do wrong because she's that age. Every eight, nine, ten-year-old, they have this built in their mind that, you know, there's a way to do things. Well, our kids, man, they'll just tell you straight up, no, that's wrong. And they'll tell you why. And they won't back down. It's like, go ahead, tell me anything different. But as a kid, I can see where they got it from. But as a kid, I was watching, as he did things, I'm thinking, I walked up to my dad, I was like, he, he sinned seven times since he got to our house. And my dad's like, stop, stop, stop. you know, push me away. I, Man. I was like, all I'm trying to do is, you know, it just didn't make sense in my mind. And I thought, you know, I thought after he said that, I thought, I want to achieve that. But then the very person that told me how to do it, Failed miserably. There is no sinless perfection until glorification. That is when we are together with God in heaven. See, many people will say, well, I make mistakes or I'm not perfect or I'm only human. But usually these are excuses. They defend, try to defend ourselves. There is a difference when we finally just say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Just saying, I am a sinner. When was the last time we went to God and said, God, I am a sinner? No, because we're just like, oh, God, I made a couple mistakes today. Oh, God, you know, I just, I just, just being human again. Do you know who knows what it's like to be human? Jesus knows. And he was still without sin. He knows what it's like to be human. He knows the battles that we face. We're not alone in this. To say that we have no sin puts us in the dangerous place because God's grace and mercy extends to sinners, not to those who make mistakes, not to those who say I'm only human, not to those that say I'm not perfect. God's grace and mercy extends to sinners. And if we don't think we fit into the category of sinners then what does God's grace and mercy extend to? We need to have victory. And that victory comes from recognizing, first of all, that we are sinners, and that we are a great sinner, and that we serve an even greater Savior. He says in verse 9, if we, this is John once again, 
And notice that he's throwing himself into the category again. You may say, oh, John, he wrote the book of Revelation. Oh, hey, he gave us scripture today, but you're saying that John sins? He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word confess is the idea to say, uh, to say the same as. To say the same as. You know, when we confess our sins, we are willing to say and believe in our heart the same thing about our sin that God says about it. That's us admitting that we agree with God about our sin. Do we go to God and say, I agree with you about my sin? See, the Pharisees, they bragged about how righteous they were in Luke chapter 18. And they says, ah, at least I'm righteous in this verse and over here. You know, he's just a sinner. But that sinner was over there beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. See, the one that walked away justified was not the Pharisee who thought he was all righteous. At least I have sinless perfection. No, the man who went to God and says, be merciful to me, a mistake maker. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Be merciful to me, not perfect. No, they be merciful to me a sinner he recognized who he was in the sight of God see confess <laughs> once again translated it's a verb in the present tense this means that we should be confessing our sins it should be something ongoing not a once for all confession but something that's consistent something that's ongoing and recognizing that we are sinners you don't have to go to confessional booth and talk to a person perverts behind the booths you don't have to talk to them you just go right to god we need to confess our sins to the most straightforward way by admitting to god the sin that we have committed and asking for divine forgiveness that only god can give confession is vital to maintaining our relationship with god and in the context that john is speaking of right here in this passage as god convicts us of our sins you know, this ought not to be something that hinders us from our walk with him. It's taken care of right away, immediately. He will forgive us of our sins, because in him is no darkness at all, but in us, ah, plenty of it. We need to be emptied of this darkness, to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. I want you to understand that confession must be personal. To say, God, if I've, if I've made any, could you forgive me on that one? <laughs> or to say, you know, not convincing yourself, you know, if, you know, if I made a problem or if I did sin, I want to make sure that I reveal the sins to my life. Because if I'm just going to you and asking for you to forgive a multitude of sins, then I'm not correcting anything in my life. I'm not. It's like having a black wall and you get some white paint and you just take the bucket of paint and you throw it on the wall and you say, wow, look, it's white. And then as the white begins to smear <coughs> towards the bottom of the wall, you know what peeks through? That black again. And you say, oh, I know how to fix this. <coughs> and you throw white paint over the black paint again. And then you're like, ah, oh, phew, that was a close one. And then it begins to ride down the wall again and black seems to seep through and you're like, oh, I know how to fix this. See, it seems kind of redundant. It seems like we're not accomplishing anything. Well, shouldn't we be trusting God and saying God can actually cleanse all of that? You know, he, he, he's the one that we can ask to come and <coughs> clear the black. Can't say, well, if we made, it isn't specific. It isn't honest. Because God is faithful and just forgive us of our sins. We need to treat God truthfully if we wanted to be treated truthfully. The promise of John chapter 1 is not a reasoning where we could say, hey, I'll go out and sin because I know God will forgive me afterwards. It shouldn't lead us at that point. See, confession should lead us out of sin. Knowing that God could only be faithful and just to forgive our sins because the wrath we deserve was poured out on him. It shouldn't lead us to sin. It should lead us away. There is no more sure evidence that a person is out of the fellowship with God than for someone to contemplate or commit sin. I could just ask God for forgiveness later. 
Since God is light and in him is no darkness at all, we can be assured that the person who commits idea has no fellowship with God to begin with. We must go to God truthfully. We want our sins forgiven. Are we just taking that, that white paint and tossing it on a black wall? Or are we actually going to the one who can actually take care of the problem? Truthfully. Too often, the reason why we say, I'll just ask God for forgiveness later is because we have intent on going back and doing it again. Well, I'm just going to go do it again. And I'm going to go do it again. And I'm going to go do it again. So I'll just ask God for forgiveness. off. At least it kind of keeps me still talking to God. You know, but I'll, I'll fix all those things later. You're manipulating the relationship with God. That's a manipulation. God is light and no darkness at all. So if we think God is going to look at the darkness that we're just saying, just look past it. Come on. We don't see him as light. To begin with. And then he closes out this passage, verse 10. He says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See, if we deny the presence of sin, if we are self-deceived, we are denying. God's word. Sin is always going to be present, but so is the remedy. Sin will always be there to be a hindrance in our relationship, but God is always faithful. See, the idea that his word is not in us relates to this idea that Jesus is in fact the word of life that we would see in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. If we refuse to see sin in us, we show that Jesus is not in us. See, no man has ever kept out of God's kingdom for his confessed badness. No man was ever kept out of God's kingdom for his confessed badness, but many are for their supposed goodness. Do we see ourselves as sinners or just mistake makers? Do we see God as light, or are we liars, and we see God as, oh man, he, he allows some darkness. See, should, sin shouldn't keep us from having a relationship with God, to have fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God gave us the remedy when he sent his only begotten son to die and to shed his blood for the entire world. If we want to have fellowship with God, then we must know the light, walk in the light, and keep close accounts with God. We don't want to be those liars that say, oh, I have no darkness, or oh, I don't sin. That's not rightly dividing the word of truth. That makes you a liar, and the truth is not in you. If anything we gather from tonight is not so much, you know, what we shouldn't walk away from is the idea of conviction. We ought to be sensitive to God's leading and conviction. We ought to be sensitive to it because only God provides us. That is a grace that God gives us. We look at it as a bad thing, but God says, this is a good thing. The Holy Spirit convicting you? This is good. That means you can go right to God. But if we think of it as a bad thing, then we'll fall down into a snare of the deceitfulness of Satan where we could say either sinless perfection exists or we can say, well, until I feel guilty about it, I'm just going to continue to live the way I want to live. May we correct that this evening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for uh, this, this the study within this passage, Lord. I, I love the book of 1 John. I love the study because, Lord, I know what I am. And even as a pastor, it's just one beggar telling another beggar where to find the bread. Lord, as we study the word of God together, Lord, I don't stand up here because I've reached perfection and everyone needs to be with me. But Lord, just as he's learning, Lord, and that we need to be at a point where we follow others because they follow Christ. See, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Paul wasn't saying follow me because I'm just the greatest person in the world. He said follow me because I'm walking in the light. And the only reason others would follow him is because they were walking in the light also. 
Lord, I ask that you would help us as we move forward in our Christian walk, Lord, that we would draw nigh to the light, that we wouldn't allow unconfessed sins to fester in our hearts, but, Lord, we would confess those before you because we know that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, bless the invitation. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If we could, let's do the uh, invitation hymn 294, just as I am. We did that one earlier today, but I want to sing that one again. 294, just as I am. Let's stand in the spirit of prayer, continue to pray, asking for God's leading. Just as I am is how we ought to come to God, just as you are. Confess those things before God, because he is faithful, just as I am. Just as I am. Understanding of uh, the, the question, does sin bother me? Or may we leave today questioning what our fellowship is with you. Is it something that's genuine or is it something that we're just bidding our time? Or do we actually see you as light or, or are we liars? Lord, I ask that you help us Guide us, use us in a mighty way to honor and glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.